Um, well, it's great to be here again. These guys do such a wonderful job of putting together a program that goes with whatever they're talking about. Um, I was with the Detroit Historical Society for 15 years up until last June, which makes me curator emeritus now as opposed to senior curator, old guy curator. Curator emeritus means old retired guy curator. So. <laughs> Which is great, uh, but we've worked with them for years, and they do they do such a wonderful job not only in their exhibits, but in in bringing in people to to give these presentations, and it's always lovely to be here. Um, while it's raining outside, I appreciate you all braving the, the the spring weather. This is one of my favorite times of year for a couple of reasons. It's that week when the grass starts getting green again, which is good for everybody. But for boat folks, this is also the year the, the time of year when when the, the the lakes open up again to commercial shipping. Um, yesterday, the St. Lawrence Seaway opened. Tomorrow, the Whaling Locks Whaling Canal opens, and then on Friday, um, the Sioux Locks or on Saturday, the Sioux Locks open up. So all of a sudden. The whole system is back open after a relatively mild winter, um, but it's nice to have us back on track here. Several years ago, the University of Michigan Press asked me to write a, a book about the Great Lakes passenger steamers. And um, I was in the middle of two major projects, and it was one of those things that I, it probably would have been easiest to say, I just can't do it now, I'll try to do it later. Um, that's not what I said, of course, though, because I've learned that if you're an author, um, the easiest part is writing the book. The hardest part is getting it printed. So when a press comes to you and asks you to do something on one of your favorite topics, you just say yes and you make it happen. And I think, I mean, I've always been a fan of, of all aspects of the, of the lakes. Uh, I'm a sailor, have been for years. I learned, you know, not only rag boating, but stink boating. And uh, I had the opportunity to work on the Boblo boats for a summer, which was, I had the best job. <laughs> best job, I was the DJ, okay? <clears throat> DJ was great. You don't have to push any oil down in the engine room, and you don't have to uh, swab up after, um, you know, messy kids. And, uh, and you just get to play music, which is, it was a lot of fun. So I've, I've been parts of several aspects of the Great Lakes Maritime. Um, the, the steamboats, the passenger steamboats, though, I think have been, have been overlooked for a long time, and this was an opportunity to kind of fix that. Um, if you think about it, you know, if, if I say uh, steamboat gothic, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is some of Mark Twain's writings and, and perusings, and also, you know, the, what the, the, the showboat, the Joan Kern showboat. I mean, that's the, when, you, when you think steamboat, when you think steamboat gothic, um, you're automatically kind of placed on the Mississippi River, which is fine. That was an interesting era. It took place before the American Civil War, but really it, 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 it completely overlooks what happened on the Great Lakes here. And on the Great Lakes, we really took the steamboat era not only well past the American Civil War, but you know, produced some of the largest of the vessels that were ever used on either the coastal or, or intercoastal um, US waters for moving people around, and some of the grandest architecture as far as ship, ships go. One of the coolest parts about this is it's a, it's a history that we can really bookend. And as a historian writing a, vessel, a book about these big, beautiful vessels, and we've moved passengers on ships for a long time, uh, but I'm talking about the really big, really fancy boats. When I talk about palace steamers, and this is a picture of the South American getting ready to leave in 1967 um, for Expo 67 Montreal. So that book ends one, one side is August 27th, 1818, when the walk in the water arrived here at this almost this very same spot, 149 years earlier, there had already been two two steamboats on Lake Ontario. Walk in the water was for the upper lakes, and then we can bookend this with the date that the South American finally blew that whistle for the last time in Detroit, 
and headed for Montreal. Once it was at Montreal, it was in the seaway, and it was on its way to, to salt water. And so that really kind of ended that, that wonderful period. There were some other steamboats. In fact, there's still one. We'll talk about that. But this is kind of a neat way to go. Um, it resulted, I mean, the steamboat business resulted in, uh, you know, a, a full-scale coverage of all five of the Great Lakes, and it was a business, and I know that the, the exhibit here is kind of concentrating on the industry aspect of it, and moving people around was very, very important. It was early important, early on, it was very important moving people into the Great Lakes region. A little bit later, it was important for moving people around the Great Lakes region. And once they'd established themselves, it became very important for their recreational purposes. And we're going to kind of cover all three of those things. These are just representative routes. There were lots and lots of companies doing this, some very big ones, which we'll talk about. Um, but first, a little background. Everybody knows Robert Fulton, or everybody thinks they know Robert Fulton as the father of the steamboat. And really, he was involved in developing steamboats early on in 1803. I think he was over, um, you know, drawing up this kind of thing. He was trying to build a steamboat for the French government. And he did the same thing that all early steamboat guys did. They got a basic hull that probably had masts on it until just recently, took the masts out, dropped an engine into the middle of it, broke it so that it sunk, because the engines, they didn't realize how heavy those engines were. And that's almost every steamboat guy started by breaking his boat. And then bringing it up again, reinforcing it, and putting that steam engine back in. Um, important with Robert Fulton, though, is he wasn't the first guy to do this. Okay, William Henry on the Conestoga River over off the Chesapeake um, was really the first guy who had a boat with a steam engine that ran on a regular schedule meant to carry people. He would also carry barrels of apples or whatever else was going to market, but it was meant to move people around. So long before Robert Fulton was doing it, um, Bill Henry was doing it. Also Jim Rumsey and John Fitch, uh, very, very creative guys. I threw these pictures in because it shows kind of some of the various ways they tried to power boats before they put the paddles on the side. They actually put oars on the side. Or they had oars in the back. That back one is kind of a pusher. That didn't work very well. This one of Fitch's was an endless paddle that ran in the middle of the vessel. That was not a bad idea, but it was really hard to fix when it broke. And the lower one in the lower left there is a pneumatic thing that brings water in the front of the boat and throws it out the back of the boat. Today we'd call it a jet ski. Okay. <laughs> So these ideas were all being percolated as we were developing steamboats in, uh, in North America. Fulton gets the credit because he teamed up with a very, very rich guy named Livingston, and they got a patent on it in the, city of, or in the state of New York um, and, and a paddle-wheeled boat. And because they had that patent, they really owned a lot of the technology going forward. Anybody that wanted to run a paddle-wheeler on the Ohio River, wanted to run a paddle wheeler on the Great Lakes or on the East Coast, had to deal with the Fulton Livingston patent, much like the Selden patent and how Henry Ford had to deal with that in the, in the automotive business. So um, Fulton was indeed important. And in fact, his early technology was the technology that was used here, was used on the Ohio River, which got a steamboat in 1811. And then finally, the Great Lakes came to it uh, in, by 1817. And this would have been the first one, a Canadian boat called the Frontenac, was built over near Kingston, Ontario, and was the first of the steamboats in the water. And so the Canadians for a while claimed that they had the first steamboat on the, on the Great Lakes. The only problem is they had a boat without a steam engine. Okay? Unusually, I, this boat was built by Americans. This is soon after the War of 1812, and the Canadian consortium hired a, an American shipbuilder, because he had the best, best thing going, um, to build their ship. So I, it, to me, it's one of those things that tells us we got over the War of 1812 pretty quick. Um, they put the boat in the water. They sailed it to Kingston. And while they were doing that, a group over in Sackett's Harbor, uh, which had been kind of the American uh, shipbuilding area during the War of 1812, put together a little bit smaller boat that they called Ontario got it into the water, put in an Allaire steam engine uh, that was built in New York, and actually had steam up and got it running 
uh, prior to the Canadian vessel getting its steam engine. So uh, we can claim the first vessel on the Great Lakes to run under steam power. Um, it did what almost all of those early vessels did. Um, they basically take, took the, the engine and put it in the center. They put the paddle wheels off to the side. They figured the paddles were so heavy, they just set them in the crock of the, you know, the, the area where it turned, and they didn't even clamp them down. And that was great until they got out into open water. And if you think about it, all the early vessels that had been tested on the East Coast had all been done on rivers. And rivers are relatively flat. On the Great Lakes, you put a boat out on a rolling, rolling sea, and all of a sudden those paddle wheels that aren't tagged down pop out, and they break. And almost all of the early vessels did that. Pretty soon they tagged them down. Um, the first vessel on the upper lake, so anything above Niagara Falls, uh, was the walk in the water for the following year. And it was built in Black Rock, which is slightly down the Niagara River from Buffalo. Um, and was actually towed um, up the river because it didn't have enough power to beat the Niagara River. These vessels would run about six knots, seven miles an hour, um, which is okay until you get into a big headwind, which, and how many boaters have we got here? All right, so you guys know, you run into a headwind, you better have a little more power. Um, this is actually a pretty good look at the vessel. Very often the pictures of it show it with a, a big kind of a banana shape on the front, and that was wrong. Um, these, are, these are people getting ready for the boat. They know it's getting built in Detroit. So this is going to connect Detroit and, and Buffalo, and this is a big deal. Um, expectations have been on tiptoe for more than a week looking out for the steamboat walk in the water. Um, her detention is consequence of some part of her machinery being out of a repair. That's the paddle wheel jumping out of, the, out of its crux. Um, so they got this, they finally got the boat going, and all of a sudden, what used to take a couple of weeks through pretty swampy traveling um, turned into about a day and a half to three days of traveling, depending on the weather. So all of a sudden, it compacted the timeline it took for people to get from the East Coast to Detroit or back. And all of a sudden, things like fresh oysters were coming in because the steamboat. Uh, between what they had going up the, the uh, uh, Hudson River and then the Erie Canal, of course, opened pretty soon after this, and then they had the steamboat on Lake, uh, Lake Erie. Um, all of a sudden, the, the trip from the East Coast to Detroit took less than a week so they could get fr fresh oysters. And that was a real change. Um, and here's, we've, got, we've actually got the, uh, the entries from the logbook of, of when the Walker and Water arrived in Detroit. It was a huge deal. They brought everybody down. Uh, they toured the boat. They took a trip up in the Lake St. Clair, kind of a moonlight cruise that we all would have been used to, uh, the Bablo boat type of thing. And then the boat wooded up and headed back to Buffalo. Um, beautiful model. If you haven't been to the Dawson Museum recently, we've got a model exhibit going on. We've got about 160 of our 200 models out on display right now. And one of the finest ones is by Ted McCutcheon, who lives up in Walloon Lake right now. And this is a beautiful version of the walk in the water, much more refined than anything else you'll see. There's a real nice model in the Clements Library in Ann Arbor, much like a couple of that we've got that are wrong. Ted did some really serious research, found a documentary uh, piece written by a guy from France who described the fact that the engine actually had a cover over it. Every other model you're going to see has got a wide open engine. You can look into the engine compartment. Ted covered it. So this is probably the most exacting model of that. You notice the uh, <coughs> lavatories right in front of the paddle wheels there. Self-flushing, I would say. <laughs> and lots and lots of wood. These guys went through cords and cords of wood for every trip that they took. Uh, the problem was that the, the walk in the water didn't last very long. It uh, was running for three years. It was able to make a trip with some US troops up to Mackinac and uh, actually made a touch over in Green Bay, uh, took Lewis Cass over there to sign some Native American treaties. Uh, but then it left Buffalo one day, ran into a headwind, uh, was almost to the night, almost to, uh, to Dunkirk, which was its next stop along the, along the shoreline. And it, the winds came up, blew it back to Buffalo. And you can see the Buffalo Lighthouse there. Blew it up on a sandy beach. It kind of you know, went up and bounced, bounced a couple of times, and then it was done. And it stayed there. And the woman who commissioned this painting, along with the engineer, 
got off the boat, swam to shore, went down to the lighthouse, got the keeper, came back. They got everybody off safe. And when she was done, kind of out of, uh, uh, she was the wife of Thomas Palmer, same family that created Palmer Park. Um, when she got done, she hired this guy, this John Matthews, to paint two different pictures. There's one that we've got in our collection of the boat from the beach, and there's one that the Burton Historical Collection has of actually being on deck during the shipwreck. And it was the first shipwreck. Although they left the boat there over the winter, they went in and pulled out the engine. The vessel, the, the timbers of the vessel are still where they laid, but the engine was repurposed and put in another, in another boat. Because the engine was worth more than actually the wood and the uh, energy to put the boat together. So it went into the Superior and ran for another 10 years, I think. Uh, in Detroit, this was a crisis. May be considered one of the greatest misfortunes which have ever befallen Michigan, OK? Speedy communication shot. They're back to the dark ages, a long way from everywhere. Um, and the greatest misfortune, this comes three years after the War of 1812, when the British took the town and killed a lot of people, and only, what, 15 years after the town burned to the ground. The death of the walk in the water was the biggest tragedy as far as they were concerned, and I think that's kind of important. Uh, from this point, the, the vessels built. They got bigger and bigger. The Michigan was unusual in that it had two engines, um, each independently running one paddle wheel. Uh, this didn't happen a lot. There were probably a dozen boats created like this. Um, but the problem was, uh, unlike today where you can get a, a thing that, that, that synchronizes two engines together, they couldn't quite get it synchronized. So it kind of did this as it traveled down the lakes. <laughs> Um, not the best way to go. Interesting idea, but it didn't work. But you notice that now the cabins are getting bigger, whereas the walk in the water had one cabin for men, one cabin for ladies, um, all below deck. Now they've got cabins on the deck, and the observation room has moved upstairs. Uh, we've got different kinds of engines, and I'm not going to go into the, the technicalities of this uh, called a steeple engine. Uh, but one of the things that's happened is they've moved the pilot house to the front of the vessel. And this kind of became a standard on the Great Lakes. You'll still, still see it on old uh, Great Lakes steamers. Um, it makes it easier when the vessels are entering the harbor to have the guy steering up front instead of at the back. And it just made it easier for the, for the mariners to not run into things. Um, picture of Detroit about the time of statehood, 1837. You can see we've got a number of steamboats. At this point, Detroit has built and owns more steamboats than the other cities along the Great Lakes. Of course, Cleveland's coming up. Buffalo's a bigger town, but Detroit is building uh, more of these ships. And why were people coming? People were coming first for the, you know, the lands were opening up, the minerals were starting to understand that, but there were a lot of tourists. Okay, and getting as far as, as Niagara Falls wasn't that difficult now that the Erie Canal has been opened up. But people, this is from, well, this is from the 1850s, but by 1820, people are going up to Mackinac Island. Mackinac Island is becoming a tourist destination. And this kind of sets the tone for what goes on for several years after that. Um, during this period, as we've got a, a really huge influx of people coming into the Great Lakes, um, most of the cargo from the Great Lakes, we're shipping out grain by this point, and it's going out on schooners and barkentines, brigantines. Um, we've got some small, smaller steam vessels that are carrying both freight and passengers. But because there's so many passengers coming in, there's a real competition between the steamboat companies, and they just keep building these boats bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is what I call, or what most people call, the first Palace Steamer era. Uh, Palace Steamer era lasted from about 1835 till the crash in 1857. And these boats became pretty spectacular. Some of, I think, uh, Empire State was almost 300 feet long. And one of the problems with these boats, they're, they're all built out of wood, um, is that a wooden vessel is made to what sailors call work. It's made, the hull is made to kind of move around a bit. You can't stop wood from, from moving. But when you make a vessel and it's so long and so thin, you get what I call kind of the hot dog effect, right? You know, if you get in any kind of a sea, the boat's not only doing this, but it's doing this. 
all right? It really starts to work, and this was kind of tough on the vessels. So they added what they call them hogging arches to keep the boat from hogging. Um, and this, this one's actually got two different kinds of hogging arches uh, stretching the length of the vessel. They also tried putting steel strapping in on the inside of the hull. Um, here's another one that not only has the hogging arches, but you can see all of the guy wires that they're using to try to, to try to stiffen up the hull to keep it from working so much. But the inside of these boats were just absolutely gorgeous. This would have been one of the smaller ones with kind of a single salon running along the center. Of course, all the machinery is in the center, so you'd be walking around that as you went. And they often put windows in there so you could watch the, the engineers down in the space. But all of the spaces would have had really thick carpeting. All of the walls were beautifully enameled if they weren't art woodwork with lots of varnish on them. There was artwork beyond the beautiful carving that was done. Um, you know, chandeliers and things, they, they learned pretty quick on that when you had a chandelier, you had to wire it off so it doesn't swing back and forth, making your passengers woozy. Um, they, got, they got that one pretty quick. Uh, but on the bigger boats, some of the real, the real palace steamers that had two or three levels of salon, these are spectacular. And, you know, the walls are lined with, with stateroom doors. Um, but most people, the staterooms were pretty simple, even right up to the end of the, the entire period. Um, most people spent their time out in the, in the main salons being seen. It was the place to go to be seen, and, and, and it was a, it was a wonder, wonderful part of the experience. You also remember that 300 feet long with a couple of decks, you've got almost a half a mile you can wander around this boat. And when compared with railroads, which was the, the, the oncoming competition, of course, railroad technology was still pretty young too, but on a railroad, you've got you know a few cars you can wander back and forth on on a long trip. On this boat, you can get out and amble. This was the best, finest way to travel. They had great food, beautiful dining rooms. It was a it was a a real experience for people of a relatively middle class. A lot of immigrants coming in, and at this point. The German and Irish immigrants that we're getting mostly um, are, are fairly well-to-do. And they, the guys would all stay down with all of their farming equipment on the main deck, and they'd rent a cabin for the ladies, and, and everybody would socialize. Um, all of a sudden, there's, there's some competition, and there's some serious headwinds. And the headwinds initially uh, was the Panic of 1857. Started in Ohio, but it was what we suffered back in 2008, 2009. It was a real estate bubble that burst and spread across the world. In fact, all that wheat that we were sending to Europe, you know, uh, Milwaukee and Chicago wheat, that all collapsed. Europe couldn't afford to buy it anymore. Really, the whole, the whole shipping business on the Great Lakes collapsed um, based on, you know, the monetary crisis created by the bubble. Um, more competitions coming from the railroads. 1850, you can see along the bottom of Lake Erie, there isn't a railroad. So that those, those big palace steamers who are either owned or run for the railroad from Buffalo to Detroit um, have no competition. By 1860, that line has gone in, and they do. Not only that, but it, it doesn't show it here, but the Canadians have built, uh, Grand Trunk Western has built a, a line across from Buffalo to Detroit and Buffalo to Port Huron. So all of a sudden they're getting some competition. Um, they're also getting competition for more efficient vessels. This is uh, in Buffalo, and you can see in the foreground you've got the canal boats that are unloading. You've got a steamer there that's got you know, the room for the paddles so that you've got the, the guards, the boats wider to cover the paddles, which is great. You can get more people in more staterooms on the, the paddle wheelers, which at the time were just called steamers. But then you can see off to the, the left there, there's what they get, the thinner boat. It's a propeller. They've started using propellers to throw the boats. It was a, a, a different technology. It was a little tougher to do because, of course, you had to have a propeller shaft going through the hull of the boat, an automatic hole in your, in your bottom, and they had to figure out saber bearings and ways of doing that in stuffing boxes. But the propellers were uh, far more efficient. They used about half the wood, eventually coal. Um, so they were much more efficient to run. They didn't run as fast, whereas the, the, the paddle wheelers could get 15, easily 15 knots, uh, sometimes up to 18. The propellers ran about 10. So it was kind of a trade-off for speed and comfort. 
Uh, propellers tended to yaw a little bit more than the, than the paddle wheelers. Um, they all had their benefits and their downfalls. Another thing was those big steam engines. Uh, fires were not hugely common, but when there was one, it was a huge PR disaster because here's a, a case of, um, which this is eerie, you know, and in a matter of minutes, 125 people are dead. Maybe not from the fire, but most of those people didn't swim. Okay, most of them had come over and your choice was burning or jumping, and that was, that was an ugly choice. And if you think about it, the guys had big wool suits on and the women had worse. You know, 15 petticoats and, and big hoop skirts. Hard to swim that way. So um, PR, PR disasters, oh, and there were collisions too. Um, you know, we didn't have buoys, we didn't have not many lighthouses at this point. Rights of way weren't established, nobody had running lights. These were all things that came on kind of after the disasters of, of 57. So not everything was rosy, and, and the crash really kind of killed it. Uh, most of the big uh, boats, I think there were 15 large palace steamers running before 57, and all but, I think all but six of them shut down permanently, and three of those were out of business in a couple of years. So it was pretty bad for the palace steamers. Smaller vessels survived. The arrow ran here between Detroit and Sandusky. Um, I think it might have made Cleveland stopping at the Erie Isles would stop at Toledo. So there were smaller boats that would still move people around, but these were not the palace steamers of old. So that got us through the Civil War and into a whole new period. And I, not, not to really dig into the business too deeply, but there were, there were lots of different business models that worked, and I, they're discussed in the book, uh, which you can get through the University of Michigan Press. Uh, they actually send you to the University of Chicago Press to buy it, but it's easily gotten through Amazon or any of those. Um, two different business models that I talk about in, a, in a, a bit more detail, Albert Goodrich out of Chicago, and then the Owen and McMillan interests out of Detroit. And they were kind of two completely separate things that worked very well for most of the rest of the steamboat era. Uh, Goodrich was just Lake Michigan and then kind of stuck his nose up into Lake Superior and got some business there. He was an active captain. He steered his own boats. Um, he had 26 vessels in 67 years, which was pretty good. Um, he used both steamers and propellers. He used new and used boats. Um, he bought them from various shipyards, from Cleveland to Manitowoc, and he absorbed several of the other companies as they were going out of business. By comparison, the Owen and McMillan interests, who were the Detroit and Cleveland Navigation, DNC is the, the short term for that, um, they ran just on Lake Erie, and then they had at various times a trip up to Mackinac. So they had kind of a Lake Huron division that would stop at, at smaller ports on the way up if they had the capability and then stopped at Mackinac and came back. They were all financiers. They were involved in lumbering, they were involved in real estate, they were involved in shipbuilding. Um, not, not surprisingly, they built all of their ships except one, which they bought from Goodrich. Um, they had only 14 vessels in 82 years. They took care of these ships. They were all paddle wheelers. They never had a propeller in their fleet. Um, again, they built them all in their own yards, and they had close relationships with all the other fleets that were running them around them. So their, their people sat on the boards of the uh, Cleveland and Buffalo line, the CNB line, the Buffalo and Detroit line. Um, they, they were really involved in the business part of the business. Both of these guys did very well in the steamboat business. Um, this is a picture, now we're on to the new Palace Steamer era, the beginnings of it after the Civil War. Uh, DNC started with two boats, and the Aaron Rice was one of them. This is a beautiful Robert Hopkin painting we've got. Um, kind of got things rolling again, uh, carried freight on the main deck, so loose freight, uh, brake bolt freight, and then had nice passenger accommodations on the second deck. Uh, they, their second boat burned, and they needed a boat quickly, over in, uh, in Chicago, Albert Goodrich had built the Northwest. Beautiful, beautiful new boat. He ran it its very first year, but realized he had overextended himself, and he sold it 
to the Detroit interests. It was the only boat that Detroit bought used. And so they were now back to two boats and were running full scale. But you can see that we're, we're getting back into longer boats. The hogging arches are back. Uh, the rocker beam engine, uh, kind of that black, uh, there's, a, there's a rhomboid. I don't know. There's a name for that. Um, it kind of sat, and that's what transferred the power from the engine, the piston that was going up and down, to the thing that turned the paddle wheels, so that that rocker beam became the most common thing you would see on paddle wheelers. I don't think my, yeah, my pointer's not working. Um, by the time we got to the 80s, um, 1880s, the, the vessels had settled in. These are two boats of the DNC line. Uh, beautiful, beautiful painting by Howard Sprague, a young guy. Uh, he died at 28, but he was painting some beautiful, beautiful scenes, mostly for the, the steamboat companies to promote their ships. And this wouldn't would have been a, a what they call a, a spotlight salute at night when you're passing. You want to say hi to your neighbors as you go by, but you don't want to honk the horn because everybody's sleeping. So they'd use their spotlights to uh, to recognize each other. Um, and these were vessels that were running both back and forth to Detroit and Cleveland, Detroit and Buffalo, and at this point they had a Huron line, so they had some boats going north. Um, it's also a time when the tourist business is kicking in hard. And really, these guys took great advantage of promoting things like Mackinac Island. Get on the boat. We've got people who have come in. They've settled in. They've started businesses. They've started farms. They're feeling a little like they've actually got some time to go on a vacation. And sometimes it was a business vacation. A lot of guys, the businessmen from Detroit, would get to New York by taking the steamer to Buffalo, hopping on a train, and going that way. Uh, but a lot of people were also now taking advantage of the ability to get up to Mackinac and spend a few days. And um, I'm busy working on a whole project related to the beautiful artwork that was created during this period to promote this kind of stuff. It was, it was a special period in, in uh, advertising. Uh, it made it look glamorous, even though this was probably within the reach of a, of a middle class, a middle class person. If you were if you were a lower class um, laborer, you probably weren't getting on a ship and going for a trip. Um, in fact, your, your your best bet was to go up to Palmer Park or go to Belle Isle. Uh, that was kind of your weekend. And at that point, Belle Isle was out at, outside the the city limits. So um, nice place to go, but this was this was where you'd go if you could. Um, lots of different companies were doing it, some short run, some long run. Detroit was best or blessed with having the ability to send people off on relatively shorter excursions. And I think this next picture, uh, well, that's, that's another shot of Mackinac, which is great in the North American there. But this is the Detroit docks. I mean, this was a, this was a way to go. And the green boat over there is a DNC vessel, and in the eastern states was probably on its way to Cleveland. Um, the Iwana was running down to Toledo and then the Erie Islands, South Bass, um, and probably stopping at Sandusky. Cedar Point was a going thing at this point. And off to the side here, we've got Tajmu. And Tajmu ran up, usually ran up the St. Clair River. And on the St. Clair River, there were probably 18 different resorts that people would go to. Up north was 20 miles away, okay? You got on a vessel, you probably paid about a dollar um, to get yourself up there, and then you'd end up at a really nice fishing resort, or you didn't have to go fishing. You could go boating, sailboating, you could just hang out, and they, you know, all the, the food was on the American plan, and this, was, this is where people went up north, and they went by boat. Or if they went the other way, they would, you know, again, get on the Iwana or one of the several other boats that were running there, go down the Detroit River. This is when Bablo got started, became an amusement park. Sugar Island was down there. Uh, getting over the Erie Islands or getting to Sandusky was all done on these beautiful steamers. Um, at this time, and, and, and this is a real special time, we get to 1900, and you know we're starting with all of the industry in Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago has been established. We're going into a beautiful period where, in Detroit especially, that's switching over to different uh, manufacturing processes specifically related to the automobile business, uh, people started to have some more money. The middle class started to grow. Between 1899 and 1915, uh, shipyards around the Great Lakes built 33 large passenger-moving steamboats. 
33. So that's about two a year, massive vessels for just for moving people. And really, that, that period, you would have suspected that the industry was in really, really good shape. Uh, but in 1915, that, that stopped. They built two more big boats in 1924, 23 and 24, and that was it. So really, the golden age for the second Palace Steamer era was 1899 to about 1915. And I point this out because many people think that the Depression destroyed the steamboat industry, put the steamboats out of business. And that, that wasn't true. They were already starting to consolidate in 1915. They were already starting to say, um, we may have overextended ourselves. Um, and there's also more competition. Certainly the railroads are much more influential. They're taking the, the regular, that, and we, Detroit had a wonderful uh, interurban system. If you wanted to get around southeastern Michigan, you probably weren't taking a steamboat all the time. And you could catch an interurban to Port Huron and all the cool little towns in between that was a lot faster and a lot cheaper than taking the steamboat. Um, there was also changes in the way the boats looked. Um, some of those new vessels came out looking more like ocean liners. Okay, they didn't have paddle wheels. They were propellers, they were thinner, they were taller. Uh, this is a line that uh, ran over to uh, Duluth. And here's the famous North and South American. These are the ones that many people remember. Uh, even folks here might have done a, a high school trip on it or done a, a honeymoon. These are the ones that survived the longest. This is in Chicago. The company was in initially founded in Chicago. For some reason, then moved, I think, to Indianapolis as their headquarters, and then they came to Detroit. Um, DNC, the whole period, stayed with the paddle wheels. They kept, they kept those beautiful boats, that beautiful line. And you can imagine that if you look at these from the top, they're, they're long and thin. And you've got one central uh, salon and then uh, staterooms along the side. Whereas here, They've got one central salon with staterooms on the side, and then they've got a hallway, and they've got staterooms that run along the outside of the boat. Because of the paddles and the, having to take the guards outside the paddles, it added a lot to the real estate that you could sell people. So these were, uh, you could get more people on these boats by quite a bit. Um, I put this into the boat, I really, into the book. I had to fight because this is really cool. This is a fold out that shows you how complicated, these were moving cities. I mean, they would carry 3,000 people, and you'd have another 500 people that worked on the vessel, both the crew, but all the cooks, and all the stewards, and all the housekeepers. Uh, it, was, it was a floating hotel. And, you know, the wonderful places to go and relax. The Gothic room down at the Dawson exemplifies that. It was one of the place, it was the men's smoking lounge. And the ladies didn't have a smoking lounge. They weren't allowed to smoke. In fact, men weren't allowed to smoke cigarettes. They were encouraged to smoke cigars and pipes, but cigarettes, they didn't even sell them down in the, in the cigar store. Um, and the insides of these things were back to palaces, okay? I mean, we're talking Versailles for some of the interiors on these boats. They had beautiful artwork. They had spectacular plaster work. Um, these things were, were beautiful. This is the men's smoking lounge from the city of Cleveland, three which was great. The, the, the area on this side of the picture was kind of a general lounge that where women were allowed the area on the other side was smoky as hell. Um, and women probably didn't go there. But I, might, I show this picture because the painting up over there we've still got. You'll see it at the Dawson if you go down there. We've been able to save that. Uh, the boats kept getting bigger. City of Detroit 3 is the vessel that the Gothic Room came out of. Uh, we're proud of it because it's the last example of steamboat Gothic. Great Lakes Steamboat Gothic on the Great Lakes. Um, and, you know, this is where you'd go to have lunch. Uh, they, even the North and South American were not this fancy. These were, these were beautiful places to, to go. Uh, the Greater Detroit, even larger. Uh, it, it, it and the Greater Buffalo were the largest paddle wheelers ever built in the world, save for the Great Eastern that was built to lay the transatlantic cable back a oh, century, well, 75 years earlier. But, you know, we really stepped up the game and had these beautiful vessels running. So things we ran into, and I won't go too deep into this, this is what the book's for, uh, legislation and regulation. There was both of the, um, there were steamboat acts that regulated um, how many engineers you had to have. There were the, the Siemens Act, 
um, which was, you know, this is labor legislation that was supported by progressives, and at the time a lot of that was going on. Unions were starting to become more popular in Detroit, and frankly they were needed. These guys, you know, the bunks these guys got, the food these guys got was terrible. The Siemens Act tried to fix that. It also tried to upgrade a lot of the, uh, the safety measures, particularly following the, the uh, you know, uh, shipwreck of the Titanic. Everybody got new safety measures and things got better. Ship to shore radio came in, made things, made people more comfortable when they were on a boat. That was just a good thing. Um, and there were alternative entertainments. That was probably the biggest problem. Uh, people say the car killed the steamboats as much as the Depression. Um, that's a closer argument, uh, but it wasn't just the automobile. The automobile allowed people to go, instead of getting on a boat and going up to um, Harsons Island, they'd get in their car and they'd go to Oxford. That was a long trip. And then you'd pull out your camping gear. You know, we've seen pictures of Harvey Firestone and, and Edison and, and Henry Ford camping. So rich people were camping, not just regular people were camping, but people you could afford the car, you could afford to go camping this way. In fact, this, uh, this square trailer down in the lower left um, was part of the uh, cover, American Covered Wagon Company that was founded in uh, Mount Clemens. It was one of the very first RV companies in the country. Guy founded it during the Depression, and he did very well. Okay, dentist. So, you know, don't, don't get stuck in a rut. If you're a dentist, think about RVs. Um, <laughs> The other thing was, was all of a sudden the growth of trucks. And this is a Grabowski power wagon up there in the corner, again built in Detroit. Um, and initially these trucks would start picking up the stuff at the wharf. The boat would arrive, it would be full of pianos and, and produce, and the trucks would take that stuff off to all the places it had to go. Um, but then the trucks started, keep, they kept going. As the roads got better, the trucks started traveling between Detroit and, and Toledo carrying freight, as opposed to the steamers carrying freight. And then also in Detroit, we, uh, we had the Sibley Lumber Company bought what was then termed by the Fruhoff family a semi-truck, because it was part car, part trailer, became a semi-truck. So these became the competitions for the steamers. And this is all happening before 1920. So we haven't even gotten to the Depression yet. Um, once we got to the Depression, things really fell off. And most of those companies went out of business. Goodrich's organization, AE's dead by this point, but his family's running it over on Lake Michigan, starts buying other companies, Graham and Morton and some of the other companies that were running over there. Uh, DNC consolidates its uh, BNC business, and C&B keeps running. C this used to be a massive side wheeler, four stacks, just like an ocean liner. It was huge, and then it was useless. Uh, probably only ran for about 15 or 20 years before it was redundant. During World War II, they cut it down to a straight decker, and it was over off of Chicago. I think George H.W. Bush learned to fly off of one of these straight deckers. The only two, there were two of them, they turned two of these boats in, the only two paddle wheel aircraft carriers in the United States Navy's history. So I always liked that. Most of the old boats got this treatment. They got towed out in the Lake St. Clair, loaded up with barrels of oil and old tires, and lit up and burned down to their steel. Um, it, was, it was amazing. They'd advertise it in the paper. People would line the shore. They'd go out in their boats and hang it. You'd see somebody you know, hanging out there just to see the boats go. And that's what they'd end up with. You'd take the steel in and you'd, you'd repurpose, the, repurpose the steel. We got lucky in that they did take apart or try to d demolish the, the city of Detroit three. It took them a year and a half. Never did that again. They burned all the rest of them. Um, but we were able to get the Gothic room off of the city of Detroit three and install it in the museum. And it came with that beautiful stained glass window. It actually had a pipe organ, which of course ran by steam. They had lots and lots of steam. Um, lots of boats had calliopes. So uh, this is a picture of Paul Coletta doing the, uh, the construction of getting that, getting that in there. And there's what it looks like today. It's a beautiful way when you walk into our museum, it's the first thing you see. It's a, a wonderful lobby to have. Um, not all the boats went away. The Juniata, which was built back during that big spurt of building before 1915, the Juniata got converted into the Milwaukee Clipper and ran between um, Milwaukee and Muskegon for many years, and it's still over there. In fact, I'm going to be speaking up there just before 
uh, I think the end of, end of June. Um, it's still, it's now a museum. It's the last of these great vessels that were built during the high Art Deco period. Um, so it's, a, it's spectacular. If you ever get over there, Muskegon's actually got four museum ships. Um, so it's a nice spot to go and hang out if you like these kind of things. Uh, some of you might remember the Aquarama. Um, also, this was a, an old tanker, World War II tanker, that they turned into a beautiful Art Deco vessel. Unfortunately, it, uh, it, was, it was a tough vessel to make money on, and they were never able to do that. And eventually it ended up in Muskegon, then it ended up in South Haven, then it ended up in Michigan City, it ended up in Chicago, it got towed over to Windsor, it ended up, well, first it stopped in, in Sarnia. Uh, by the time it got to Windsor, uh, scrappers had been on it and taken most of the stuff off. Uh, but only it survived, I think, until, 19, or until 2007 or 8. Finally got towed over to Buffalo and then scrapped. So they, they finally, but it, it survived. It was a character. Um, those of us in Detroit remember the Boblo boats. Um, this one's in Buffalo. They're trying to save it. Um, they were going to take it to New York and run it on the Falls River line, kind of recreate the Falls River line. This is the, one of the last of the Kirby boats. Uh, Frank Kirby was the guy who built all of those wonderful side wheelers for the DNC company. Uh, designed a lot of other things. He designed uh, the, the Boblo boats. He designed uh, icebreakers up at the, up at the uh, Mackinac Straits. Designed lots and lots of things for a lot of people, but we got the benefit of him because he worked for the Detroit Dry Dock Company, which his father had kind of started. Um, you know, and the Columbia had an old steam engine, and there was nothing like walking on the boat and sticking your head, because it was an open area, you could stick your head over and you'd get that smell of the steam engine, the oil, the hot oils that were coming off that engine, and at, by that point it was, it was burning oil as opposed to coal. Um, I got the chance to get on a coal-fired vessel, the Badger. In fact, that may be the next thing I got in here. Um, the Badger's over uh, running out of Ludington, I think, and it's still coal-fired. They had to fight the EPA tooth and nail. But man, you smell the coal smoke and you get a feel for what Detroit must have been like with all these different uh, coal-powered vessels passing. This picture is to prove that you can still take a trip on the Great Lakes. Of course, you couldn't for the last two years, but you can now. They're starting to get these boats back up and running. Uh, the Detroit Port Authority specifically put in that building to handle cruise ships. So you can do that. And these are really nice. Some of the boats are bigger than others. Some of them take 50 people. Some take about 150 people. Uh, they're expensive. You know, as opposed to a Disney cruise for 1000 bucks, you're going to pay about $5,000, um, mostly because they don't have gambling, based on what I've heard from people in the industry. Um, but that's because they go between U.S. and Canada, and they can't regulate that. So it's still possible to do that. You can also, there's the Badger. You can take a, a trip on a steam-fired, steam fired, coal-powered uh, boat today. It's about a four-hour trip across Lake Michigan. Uh, give you a feel for what it was like in the old days. But really, it ended 1967 when this guy pulled away and headed for Montreal. The, the sad part about it is the South American and the North American ran basically from Buffalo to either Duluth or over to Chicago. They always spent their life on the upper lakes, and their last trip is heading to the lower lakes and actually off to the St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, here's a bunch of people that are actually enjoying seeing Expo 67 Montreal. Um, it was kind of a, a rush to see that picture because my folks took us when we were yay big. Not by boat. But this is one of the saddest pictures, Captain Testian signaling finished with engines. And they passed the vessel on. Did I put the picture in? I did. They passed the vessel on. Goebel owned the company. The vessel was sent to the East Coast. It was meant to be a, uh, a dormitory at the Harry Lundberg School of Seamanship, which is a, a school for upcoming sailors. But the Coast Guard wouldn't approve it because of the wooden decks. Um, they had had a big fire, the Neuronic Fire, in Toronto, which killed a lot of people um, because the vessels were still, you know, now at this point 65 years old, and they really be, were fire traps. And so the South American, while it got turned over to Harry Lundberg, it never even made it to Maryland. Um, it got into New Jersey, ended up, I think, in Bayonne, and it just, I, I didn't even put a picture in because it's so sad. It just sat there and rusted. It filled with water. 
Um, we were able to go up and get some things off of it. The Great Lakes Maritime Institute, which works with the Dawson, saved many things off of the boat. Um, in fact, we're raffling off a porthole from the South American. Um, if you go to GLMI, Great Lakes Maritime Institute.org, they're raffling off a porthole, but that's about all that's left of these things. And that was, that was the end of an era. And it was real nice as a, an author, as a curator, as a historian, as a boat fan, um, to be able to write the book and get it out there so that people like you could either come listen to this in the short version or buy the book and get the full version. So thanks for coming on a rainy day. This is great. Thank you. Thank you.